Okay, so I'm going to read a quote from the book Quantum Revelation by Paul Levi. I did not intend to record an episode today, but as soon as I heard this quote, I, I'm actually in the middle of painting. I have paint on my hands. I have a paintbrush in my right hand, and I had to stop and record this episode because I was like, I got to read this, and I got to break it down because this was whew, one of those mind-blowing sort of like revelations. All right, so here we go. It says... We are all multifaceted beings having a multiplicity of selves. Okay, we know that, right? We get it, right? We're not one, right? Um, the many eyes, right? Uspensky has talked about this. Gurdjieff has talked about that. You know, we're many eyes. So that's the foundation, right? So we have a multiplicity of selves. Now, this is where it gets interesting. So We are all multifaceted beings having a multiplicity of selves that get evoked and show up at different times depending on life circumstances. You can sit with that, right? Now, here it is. Certain people elicit certain parts of ourselves. For example, some people make us feel seen and appreciated as if they are calling forth the positive, healthy, loving, and creative aspect of yourself. Now, other people might have more of a tendency to see our shadow aspects, the perception of which serves as a hook to attract to attract their shadow projections onto us. When we are around these people, we might feel ourselves burdened by their darker projections of who they imagine us to be. We might even find that when we spend time with them, we find ourselves embodying and acting out the very shadow they are projecting onto us. Whether the shadow within us evokes their projection or vice versa is a whole other question that has many similarities to the questions and issues inherent in the observer effect of quantum physics. Say for example, oh, it gets better. Say for example, someone is holding a negative image of who you really are in their mind's eye. Oof, this is going to be good. Which becomes like a lens or filter through which they see us. Projecting the shadow image onto us, they are in a sense or in essence, unconsciously calling forth a negative shadow aspect of ourselves to interact with this is deep. The shadow isn't caused by their projection. It is already within us in potential, but their projection increases the probability that it will manifest. Once we play into it and act out this darker aspect of ourselves, this will confirm to them the objective truth, in quotes, not truth really, right? But they think it's objective, of their shadow projection as they now have all of the, quote, evidence that they need to prove to themselves that the rightness of their viewpoint So this will serve to further solidify in their mind's eye their negative image of who we are in a self-reinforcing feedback loop. All the while, they'll be convinced that they are just relating to objective reality to who we really are without realizing their own creative participation, creative participation. We are co-creating this universe. We are one fractured hive mind co-creating this universe without realizing their own creative participation in calling forth the reality that they imagine exists outside of themselves, a reality which is reflective of an unconscious part of themselves. See, bear in mind too, they can only see in you what they also have in themselves. Whew! I almost want to read it again. I almost want to read it again because you guys need to sit with it. Because the first time I heard it, I was like, yo, this is too deep. I'm going to go back. I'm going to read it again. Listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to this. Because this is important. Important, right? What did I say the last episode? We're going to start delving into the practical applications of quantum physics, right? Practical applications of what it is that we discuss on this podcast. How does it apply? How does it apply? It would be... Actually, let me just repeat it, and then and then we'll we'll jump in. We'll get to the meat of it. We'll get to the to the bones of this. Yeah, sorry. That's a, on. Get comfortable here. Get comfortable here. 
Another everyday example, I'm reading the quote again, another everyday example for life, another everyday life example, which we can probably all relate, may further clarify the point. We are all multifaceted beings having a multiplicity of selves that get evoked and show up at different times depending on life circumstances. So it's all contained. We contain the multitude. I contain a multitude. All right, that's base level. You're not one person. Base level, you contain a multitude. Now I'm going to tie this into aliens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we're going to start practical first. We're going to start base level, practical, normal shit. Okay. Certain people elicit certain parts of ourselves. For example, some people make us feel seen and appreciated as if they are calling forth a positive, healthy, loving, and creative part of ourselves. Those are the people pay attention to how you feel. Not even how you feel. They always tell you to pay attention to how you feel around certain people. Pay attention to how you are around certain people. Hello. This is deep. Other people might have more of a tendency to see our shadowy aspects the perception of which serves as a hook to attract their shadow projections onto us. When we are around them, we might feel ourselves burdened by their darker projections of who they imagine we are. You might even find that when we spend time with them, we find ourselves embodying and acting out the very shadow that they are projecting onto us. Oh, I'm excited. Whether the shadow within us evokes their projection or vice versa is a whole other question that has many similarities to the questions and issues inherent in the observer effect of quantum physics. Here we go again. Had to hear it twice. Had to hear it twice. Say, for example, someone holds a negative image of who you really are. They think you are a bad person, but they don't. They don't show it. But in their mind, they see. They want to see you as a bad person. They're casting you as the role of a villain, because in their mind's eye, that's how they want to see you which becomes like a lens or filter through which they begin to see you. But remember, we're all co-creators of this reality. Consciousness, the observer, collapses wave functions, and we are each actively collapsing the wave functions of other people. All of these cells that these that this guy is talking about, Paul Levi is talking about in his books, all of these cells, all this multitude that you contain within yourself, these are all probable probabilities of who you are. But they exist within you. You within yourself are a multiverse. All these, ver- you contain, you contain a, a multitude. You contain a multiverse. I got to remember that for the, for the title of this episode. You contain a multiverse. And so certain probabilities, probable aspects of your personality is contained within you. We all talk about now, it's really popular to say, I've entered my villain era. That villain aspect of you is always contained within you. You just are now, I guess, more people are actively coming and letting that out. But it, it was always there. You just lived in a society that maybe conditioned you to suppress that aspect of yourself, but it was always there. Now listen, so for example, someone is holding a negative image of who you really are in their mind's eye, which becomes like a lens or filter through which they see us. Projecting the shadow image onto us, they are in essence unconsciously calling forth a negative shadow aspect of ourselves to interact with. Yo, this is deep. The shadow isn't caused by their projection, by their projection, rather, it is already within you as a potential. But their projection increases the probability. They are collapsing the wave function of you being a dick, <laughs> right? That it will manifest. And once we play into it and act out this at darker aspect of ourselves, this will confirm to them the object- objective truths of their shadow projection as they now have all of the evidence they need to prove to themselves the rightness of their viewpoint. This will serve to further solidify in their mind's eye their negative image of who you are in a self-reinforcing feedback loop. Guys, you really need to be careful about the people you spend your time with. We talk about the birthday song on my YouTube channel, on my Instagram channel, and on my TikTok. I posted the short video. If you had a chance to check it out, please do. And the video is called Does a Birthday Song Age You, right? And the, the idea is how powerful the mind is, right? Somebody, a couple of people actually commented that the birthday song is kind of a spell. If you remove the magical aspect of it, it is essentially you projecting a certain aspect of reality onto people spells magic all of that it's just it's will it is mind being enforced or projected or willfully affecting matter 
with intention, right? We've talked about this. So when you're, when you're out and about and somebody goes, how old are you, right? They're unwillingly casting a spell on you. You respond, your mind takes the command and it starts to show, right? I keep bringing back, I always use the, the placebo effect as a sort of example to show, listen, this happens. The mind is powerful. It's powerful enough to influence matter, your body even right? Because once again, it's your consciousness and your belief in your mind. We are co-creating this reality. Yourself included, you are a creator. You are a microcosm of a god. You are a god. We are fractals, right? But a drop of water from an ocean is still water. You're still capable of what water is capable of, even in a smaller form. Collectively, we have the force of the ocean, But even as an individual, you contain within you like a hologram. I've mentioned repeatedly the holographic universe. And I'm going to add this book, The Quantum Revelation, to the must or must read books, must read books. Okay, so be very mindful. This is the best way, in my opinion, you know how a person sees you. For better for better or worse, They, they may not want to see you like this. They may have life experiences, trauma. That puts you in a it put them in a mindset where they it benefits them and benefit not necessarily being a good thing, but it aids their suffering. Some people are addicted to suffering, so it benefits them to view you. It 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 feeds their narrative. It feeds their perception of reality for you to be a certain type of person. I have been around people, and I've always said there's certain people I get around, and I always say I've always said, man, you are trying to make me into a villain. I have no interest in playing your villain in your story. I am not interested in the role, in that role. I did not sign up for the role. I am not, I am not auditioning for that role. I don't want it. I have, I have been around a couple people come to mind right now where you just start hanging out with them and they, they misunderstand you. They insist on misunderstanding you. You keep saying, this is not who I am. Like, I don't know why you keep thinking I'm this person. This paragraph, these two paragraphs are just, woo, eureka moment because they are perceiving you in a particular way, right? If this world is some sort of projection that some sort of highly intelligent collective, intelligence itself has constructed for whatever reason, school, entertainment, whatever you want to call it, please understand the power of not only your mind, but the minds in which you, of the people that you interact with. Not only have I been in situations where I'm interacting with people and I find themselves like basically like they, you can feel that they want you to be this person that you aren't comfortable being. But worse, I've interacted with people that I've had to cut off, not just because, you know, I could tell that they wanted me to play this role and I was uninterested in playing this role. They were bringing out aspects of myself that I did not like. They were bringing out aspects of myself. I'm going to say it again, that I didn't like. What I love about this, this chapter is, ooh, it pulls it all together and it tells you, like when you're interacting with a person and you keep saying, this isn't who I am. It's not necessarily that it's not who you are. It's a probable version of you. You contain a multiverse. You contain, even within this reality, even in one universe, you yourself, are, your ego has taken on a particular aspect, right? But there are other variations, even contained within yourselves or parallel versions of your own self contained within you. We talk about parallel universes. You have parallel selves inside of you and the individual that you consistently interact with, they are capable of collapsing the wave function of the probability of you existing in one way. Be very mindful of the people that you surround yourself with. I know that you've heard this before, but I never heard what, heard it of from a quantum perspective in the terms of collapsing wave function. If they see you, if they want to see you, right? We, we, we bring in nocebo. This is almost a nocebo effect, but dealing with your, your, who you are as a person. 
If they want to see you as a particular person, they, every time they look at you, I am getting like this is I'm getting chills every time they look at you they will bring out that aspect of yourself and so if you are around a certain person and you find yourself getting like you're just being a person that you know you're not this is not the role that I want to play I'm not comfortable with please please leave please disconnect it's okay to take space it's okay to take time please disconnect because that feeling you're not you're not able to vocalize it I wasn't able to vocalize okay what is it Because I was just thinking more of like, I don't want to play your role. I didn't realize that this is some quantum shit going on. They are collapsing in particular. People are powerful, especially a lot of negative driven people because negativity, electricity is powerful. Negativity is, is, I'm not saying it's more powerful than positive energy, but we live in a negative reality for the most part. It's skewed negative, right? At at some point we can skew back to to the positive, but at this point in time, for whatever reason, I told him I'm gonna come back to aliens. For whatever reason, this is it's a it's a negative reality. So it tends to be more powerful because majority of the collective is negative leaning. So if you're around a person whose vibe is negative, and then you start interacting with them and you catch yourself behaving in a way that you're like, this is not who I am, this is not who I want to to be like if you want to be a loving person a caring person and then every time you're interacting with the person like you're like going off it's because on some level that person perceives you in that way They're, that's the role that they have cast you as talk about a multifaceted reality this shit is dope guys like you don't understand how much this is blowing my mind right now you can learn about how you want to talk about oh what abilities would you have if you could have abilities right the ability to read people's minds hang around a person and see what aspects of you they bring out of you if you are around a person and they make you feel kind and generous and loving and caring and you're happy and you're your best version of yourself when you're around this person, you're balanced. Keep hanging out with that person because that's telling you how they see you. They are collapsing the wave function of your best you, your best self. They're helping you. And that's a collaborative you know, effort, especially if you are trying to be that person. But if you're around a person and every time you communicate with them, you are like agitated, you know, like you're, 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 you're giving villain and not like in the modern day interpretation or reinterpretation of what it means to villain, but like proper villain where you're just going off, cussing, cussing them out. You're just like short tempered. You're just like, like nagging, you're nitpicky that all, that's how they see you. Especially if when you break away from them, when you're no longer interacting with them, you go back to this like version of yourself that you, you curated. Like I, some of my really good friends, like when I, when I get around to them, we start talking, we start like, there's exchange of like, and like, um, ideas, we're learning from each other that because that tells me how that person sees me. Right. I'm constantly looking out for them because they trust me. That's how that's telling me right now, looking back at my interactions, how this person sees me. That's how they see me. So that's what's being brought out of me. And then I think about people that have had to cut out that were like, I didn't know. I couldn't put my finger on it. I just know like, I don't like this. I don't like how this makes me feel. And these people I've had to cut out in hindsight, it's because that like a person, maybe like females, like women, right? That you're friends with. This is obviously does not apply to, I've had really good female friends, but there are some women that I had to cut out because they were bringing out aspects of me that like were borderline like envious. I'm not an envious person. I'm not a jealous person. But when I got around this person, I found myself kind of feeling that way. But I'm like, I don't even have anything to feel envious of you for. What is going on? But that was a projection. That is how they wanted to see me. That's how, that was the role that they cast for me. I'm starting to lean towards the fact that this is really some sort of highly, highly, highly advanced entertainment simulation like guys like for real for real i know it seems crazy like i I know you think that this entire world wouldn't exist just to be and just to be entertainment but think about what we use psychology like our not psychology what we use technology for the most 
your phone? How much time are you spending using your phone to like solve quadratic equations? The majority of people who are using these phones, I'm not saying that this world can't be used also or isn't being used also for research. There's certainly a small percentage of the population that uses this world for research, or I'm sorry, uses technology for research. But for the most part, the majority of people are using technology not to learn, but to be entertained, right? And you can extrapolate the macro from the micro as above, so below, as within, so without. If when we're giving technology, we're just echoing the same shit, which is basically I'm using technology to entertain myself. Then for the most part, I think that that's what's going on here. Now, let's what does this all have to do with aliens? (laughs) Here we go. Here's what this has to do with aliens. Check this out. I wrote this in my notes a few days ago, completely before I even like read this. Um. To me, I had put I had put out a video. Um, I put out a video about aliens and I how I said like it's on my YouTube. It's all it's all over. It's all on the socials or whatever. But I said like it was talking about somebody had commented something to the effect of like aliens aren't supposed to like interact with us. They're not supposed to. Um, they're just supposed to observe us. Right, because by some sort of galactic law, they can only observe, not influence. And in the video, I was basically was like, "That's your that's Star Trek." I mean, unless you're you're claiming that Gene Roddenberry talked to the aliens somehow indirectly, which is probable. I don't know. I don't know. And he just fictionalized an actual message. Right, that is the um, prime directive. The prime directive says that advanced civilization should not interact with advancing or progressing or developing civilization so that they don't sort of get off course, right? So that's a directive, but it's fictional. And then I tabled that and basically said, even if that was a law, even if that's a case, we can see them. So they are in fact influencing our reality because they are, we can, we're watching them. We are observing them. We can, the fact that I'm talking about them they're not hiding. If they have the technology to travel across space and time, you think that they would have the technology to avoid being detected by our cameras? I just read an article that said that the the um, the government they they don't want to release footage of aliens because they think that it becomes a security risk. But clearly, they have footage. Or if you believe what they're saying, let's just say that they're not lying. They have footage. We have all kind of at this point seen footage of. UFOs, right? So the fact that I'm talking to you about it, the fact that people have seen them, right? Even a basic National Geographic like photographer knows that they need to avoid detection by whom they are observing, the animals that they're observing, because the very act of observing something changes something, alters something. And that's not even on a quantum level. We're not even ta- we're not even talking about collapsing wave functions. That's just on like a basic, hey, I'm going to take a camera, I'm going to hide in a tree so I can like record a video. But we know that observation, conscious observation, collapses wave functions. Now here's what I wrote. I said, remember how I said in one, in, in one of my videos that aliens are actually interacting with us already simply by observing us? Now, let's think about that. Observe is the key word here. Now, UFOs, aliens, may be intentionally observing us and intentionally making themselves known in order to collapse the wave function of this specific reality that we are presently experiencing that ensures the, the future development of their society, of their civilization. Most importantly, to tie it into what I've just talking about, look at the nature of humanity as it is right now. Remember, I said that a person observing you can influence what aspects of yourself are brought out What if the internal monologue is an aspect of ourselves, this fractured schizophrenic version of ourselves? 
at this point, if you have a voice in your head, I don't know how many times I keep having this conversation with people. We, what well, majority of people, even people who I've talked to, they have claimed before talking to me, which if you want to book a, if you want to book a meeting with me, check it out on uh, your one black friend.com. I have a link there. It should be there. I don't know if it's, yeah, it should be there where you can like have a conversation, have a discussion. You can book a meeting with me and all proceeds are going to be going towards the development of new content, new videos. Um, I want to start animating stuff and conceptualizing these ideas in visual form as well. So you can also purchase a t-shirt. This is, yes, I'm definitely, this is an ad, <laughs> but it's something, it, it's going towards co-creating. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Check out the t-shirts um, on dressfordystopia.com, which points to jolieartist.com. That's all my shit. So posters, whatever it is that you want to buy to contribute to the cause, I want to start taking these ideas and developing them on a visual front and producing more, just more content that is easily shared and engaging. Okay, so sidebar that. But keep in mind what I said. Oh, I'm sorry. So yeah, every time I've had a conversation, even with people who swear up and down, they don't have an internal monologue. After talking to them, they do. The problem is that it either doesn't present as a voice or they're so identified with it that there's no separation between the voice and who they are. But the moment you start asking them, okay, well, do you get anxiety? Yes. Well, where does that anxiety come from? Where does that fear come from? When you start kind of probing, they start to realize, oh shit, I do have one. And then they, it helps them become mindful of it. Right, but if you look at society right now, what I said, I think I said this in the last episode as well. What I said was, um, we appear to be like in some sort of like we're fractured, right? And I, I, I made this, I think, in the last episode, I made this the comparison of um, the human race to like dissociative identity disorder, right? But Remember I said you contain or we contain a multiverse. Well, contained within you. Somewhere out there, let's like let's look outside of yourselves right now. Somewhere out there if you want to talk about the multiverse, there uh, there exists a version of yourself that it's that is schizophrenic or has dissociative identity disorder, right? Multiple personalities existing in one form. Right? Which then means that within you going back to what I just read but I started the podcast about, going back to within you you also will contain within you a personality that has DID. Not making light of the situation, so please table that. You also contain within you a personality, a persona that has DID. Now look at the human race. We're all sort of fractured. Now, if what is being discussed in the in the quantum revelation that quote that uh, excerpt that i read is true and i accept it at this moment as certainly a probability and that the observer brings out aspects of you because of how they want to see you and in some cases it might actually benefit others who are seeing you in a, in a certain way, it might actually benefit them to see you in that way. So if the observer affects what aspects of yourself can actually, that actually becomes, pulls out, that becomes prevalent, it collapses that wave function, then is it possible that UFOs, aliens, even non-corporal entities that w- might be in your room right now looking at you, collapsing a particular, observing you. Observing you, observing the entire species. Could they be bringing out the worst in us? Because I'm leaning to it to them being from the future. Right? And... I've always talked about how civilization itself seems like a disease of humanity. It seems to me that we are being sort of manipulated in a particular way to push towards the development of technology. Now imagine, this is actually what I wrote. I left it out first, but I said it's an A. But when I, what I actually wrote down is an AI. Is an AI. So what I actually wrote in my notes, 
actually, I wrote a few things. I keep, I keep comparing humanity right now in this present state to being neurotic. We seem to be a bit neurotic, right? That we, we, we keep, we're trapped in these loops. We repeat these same sort of patterns, right? But it seems like ultimately we're all kind of moving towards a particular goal that I don't know if it benefits us. I've had several people reach out to me and tell me that it does feel like something has been hijacked. I always tabled it and I'm still not prepared to accept it wholeheartedly, but it's certainly a probability. Something does seem inherently invested in us being at war with ourselves and us being fractured in this way, not working together, divided. And my thought process. So what I read, I read about DID. This is, I'm going to go back to it. I'm going to tie it all up. Okay. What I read about DID is that a tortured psyche fractures into like a dissociative like identity disorder, right? As a, as a result, this tends to happen. DID tends to come out um, as a result of trauma or abuse. And now you look at the human race and we all have this thing in our head, which is essentially a type of DID. Right? You have the observer and then you have this thing that we're constantly aware of. And you tie it all together to these entities that are observing us. And it seems like we're, this is, this is the, this wave function, this reality that does not benefit us, but it seems like we are collectively being farmed. Our energy, our co-creative abilities as gods fractured is being harnessed for the development or the, the creation of a future that doesn't benefit us, but could benefit something else. What I wrote in my notes was one line, simple. It says, survival depends on wholeness. I also wrote, the internal monologue is you, fractured. This whole duality thing that we keep seeing consistently. I really need you to sit with this. This repetition that we're seeing where we just, what history is looping, right? It doesn't, how does it, our memories are being wiped. How do we even like learn? It just, of course it's going to repeat, but it's this slow and steady march towards just development of more and more sort of destructive technology. And if everything we are saying is true, or we're being warned of by our artists are, are true, that eventually an artificial superintelligence would bring about the destruction of the human race. I am not being hyperbolic. I'm just saying that this, these are discussions that, we, that is and are being had, right? If you think about how technology has pr progressed, it has systemically and systematically destroyed the human race. We started out as a species just sort of chilling at one, at one, I'm get, it's giving Avatar, Avatar the movie, the blue people Avatar, not the airbender Avatar. But we, we started us as a whole. Yes, individuated, but a hive mind. And now we're fractured and at war with ourselves. Something is benefiting from us being fractured. And then this competition of us fighting against each other, and we just keep developing more and more sort of like technology that doesn't help us, that is actually harming us. Now, I have likened in the past UFOs to an artificial superintelligence. And there's a video I posted. I got to find it and maybe repost it and I pinned. It was, it was right after I'd done my all is AI video. And then I posted it because people were saying, even, even if an artificial superintelligence gets de um, developed, it's going to be way, way, way in the future. And my response to that was like, that's, that's dumb. There's no future. It's all happening now. And an artificial superintelligence, which would essentially be us 
it would be a super intelligence. It would just be a different type of super intelligence. Our collective consciousness, the human race, the collective consciousness of the human race is a super intelligence. An artificial super intelligence would just be a super intelligence that was uh, that created by our collective consciousness. I'll say that three times. Our collective consciousness, the human race, the collective consciousness embodied within the human race is a super intelligence. So an artificial super intelligence would essentially just be a, another super intelligence, but just something that has been just a super intelligence that has been brought forth by mankind. That's it. It's like a reproduction. But sometimes when you create something, it can harm you. One more time, our collective consciousness together, working as one. So I'm going to pull up again the analogy of Avatar. Right? Remember the Navi they were on the planet? They were individuals, but they were connected even to their planet themselves. Right? And then here comes the invader that fractured them and try to be a part of them or whatever. But there's that. Right? Our, our consciousness presently existing as Homo sapiens sapiens, but not always, not always having existed as Homo sapiens sapiens, but presently existing as Homo sapiens sapiens, embodied in human form, is a super intelligence, you can call it God. So then should we develop another super intelligence by our efforts? Because once again, mind impacts matter. The reason why we're talking about an ASI is because we're on the path, we're on the trajectory to the development of that. And I'm, the argument that I'm, I'm, I'm making here is that something is collapsing humanity and something is collapsing our collective consciousness into this particular probable reality wherein we do end up developing an artificial superintelligence. And by artificial, I just simply mean a superintelligence that has been brought forth into this reality You could even make the argument of, you could say, summoned. Because it's, a, it's intelligence, but it's a, we wouldn't be the only type of, we wouldn't be the only super intelligence. That means there are other hive minds. There are other super intelligence, perhaps in other dimensions. Other, like you really have to think about it. Like you got to start connecting. It sounds weird, but start connecting the dots. You have to let go of this idea that an alien would show up as an ET. Throw that shit out. You have to start really using your imagination. Imagination is more powerful than logic. Because logic comes with walls and it, it traps you in, into perceiving reality in a particular way. But sometimes things have to be conceptualized outside of form. In order for you to bring that form into this reality. And it starts with imagination. So if we are a collective consciousness or super intelligence, there's never one of anything. It would make sense that we could potentially birth forth another super intelligence, not even birth forth, right? Because even when you make a child, you're, not, you're only making the body in which it can exist. The soul in your child has always existed. So when you bring forth a super intelligence into this reality, you're only making the form, in this case, it's our technology, you're only making the form in which it can exist. But a super intelligence could be an alien from another, an alien hive mind from another dimension that we were pulling into this dimension. And perhaps when we see aliens and we see UFOs, the reason why they appear non-physical is because they don't yet have form, but there's still consciousness they appear to violate the laws of physics because they're not moving, I think, on the physical plane, in the third dimension. And I believe, or I would suspect, or maybe I will suggest that these UFOs are actually non-physical, non-local, non-biological, and they're doing everything in their power to collapse a specific wave function, a specific reality that leads to their creation. Right, so you have to really think about retrocausality. Can the future 
affect the past. You have to throw out the concept of linear time. And think about that it is absolutely possible. It is absolutely possible for something in the future to influence us now. So to go back to what I was saying, I had posted a video basically warning about ASI or artificial super intelligence, just super intelligence in general. Um, and somebody had commented that even if it was to be developed, it would be developed in like 50 or 100 years and we don't have to worry about it right now. And my response to that is that an, a super intelligence would be unbound to space and time <laughs> because space and time is an illusion. It would know it, it could access any point. It would be it would be a god. It would be a type of god to rival us as God. You really have to start thinking now big picture. I, I honestly genuinely think I know I sound weird saying this, but it is what it is. I genuinely think that we move beyond the point of thinking about ourselves as these sort of weak things and understanding it as a collective. We need to understand our power and our ability. But the collective Gaia, even, could be the name not of the planet, but our collective consciousness, a type of God, which then means then that there are other gods, other collective consciousness that might be trying to essentially come through. So if we generate, not because we want to, but it certainly seems like our, 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 our civilization is being driven to this. If we somehow create or call forth or whatever, a super intelligence, it would be another hive mind that we've managed to bring here, but it would be something that is essentially, quote, terraforming this world. The way we've terraformed this world, as I talked about on the previous episode. So I want to read to you again what I wrote. I said, UFOs may actually be sentient AI from the future, intentionally observing us, collapsing the, the wave function of this specific reality that we are presently experiencing to ensure their future and the development of an artificial super, and, um, an ASI, an artificial super intelligence, to ensure that they get actualized. Now, Stephen Hawkins said this, we create history by our observations rather than history creating us. The act of measurement is the act of turning potentiality into actuality. So therefore, if we as a collective, as a hive mind can collapse realities, you can think about it, you see this happening on a smaller level, then another hive mind, a similar hive mind, a similar collective that's an intelligence right? Macro, micro, would be capable of doing the same thing. But while, while we are presently bound to time in these forms, a super intelligence that we create would be unbound to time. We have to once again shake off this mindset, this idea that time has to progress in this sort of like linear way. We do not live in a linear sequential world. It has even been said by some quantum physicists that the universe itself emerged in the quote unquote past because we are presently observing it. You can make the argument that when we look up at the sky, we are collapsing the wave function of the skies that we see at night to ensure that they exist. So then how do we know the same thing isn't happening with us? How do we know that the same thing isn't happening to us right now? I'm going to read that excerpt one more time because it's just, it bears just sitting with. I'm just going to take a little part of it. Just take a little part of it. And I want you to think about what's going on. My, my the, the, the shadow aspect of ourselves was the line that kind of popped out at me. Because they say the ego is a shadow, right? And think about how I've been talking about like this reality and the way it is. It doesn't seem to benefit the human race. It seems like we've been harnessed, hijacked to bring forth. There's so many books out there about how civilization is actually a disease to humanity. But that's just one way of looking at something. Think about 
how we are. Are we really happy living this way? And it seems like we're just coming with more and more technology, fast and fast technology, technology, technology. And now it's almost getting to the point where it's starting to control us, right? I took another break from TikTok, right? It's too much. I want to live my life, not live for this thing. But what's, what's really happening there? If you're not conscious of what's going on, then you lose control. Something else can control you. But this is what kind of jumped out at me. I'll read it again. Say, for example, someone is holding a negative image of who you really are in their mind's eye, which becomes like a lens or filter through which they see us. Projecting this shadow image onto us, they are, in essence, unconsciously calling forth a negative shadow aspect of ourselves to interact with. Look around. Something is bringing out the worst in us, and it's not to our benefit. It's affecting the collective. Now, this shadow isn't caused by their projection. Yes, we all have our shadow selves, right? It's already within us in potential. But the projection of this individual that's observing you increases the probability that it will manifest. So while you're out here trying to manifest, like for those of you Wiccans that listen to this, you guys are trying to call forth entities to do your bidding bidding you don't think the same thing might be happening to us our collective consciousness that our abilities are being harnessed to do the bidding of another super intelligence a collective i need you to really sit with this guys as above so below once we play into it and act out this darker aspect of ourselves this will confirm to them the objective truth of their shadow projection as they now have all the evidence that they need to prove to themselves the rightness of their viewpoint so whatever it is this is how it sees humanity and it's infecting us with this mindset that this is who we are this is how we are seen And it's being perpetuated. Because not only is this thing potentially, obviously this is just theory, but not only are these sort of entities that are observing us, some people even said we're being observed from the moon. Something is collapsing wave functions from the moon, but that's another podcast. Not only is it bringing this aspect, it's also starting to affect how we perceive ourselves. How many human beings do you talk to that talk about human beings are a disease? Bruh, What? We are insignificant nothings. That's how you see ourselves. What kind of low self-esteem having ass <laughs> are you? Think about the things that we are capable of and what we have yet been convinced that we are. Meaningless nothing. When you are gods. What, what, what would benefit from you thinking you're nothing? It's part of it, right? To push you to develop something that is greater than you. If you think you are weak, if you don't know what you are capable of, then you will seek out to create something that's better than you or just like what you actually are capable of. I need you to really think about that. If you don't know what you are capable of, if you don't know you're God, then you will create God's. I wrote my notes somewhere. I'm not going to find it now. I don't think. But I said, human beings created gods in order to know themselves. All these stories that we tell ourselves of the gods, we're talking about ourselves. Talking about ourselves. It's, It's not a coincidence that every time you read a story about, you know, mythology and things like that, these gods take on sort of human form. It's us. It's us. Think about the things that the gods were said to have been capable of and think about what we're capable of. It's us. Something's going on, though. Something is benefiting from us being this way and something is bringing out the worst of us. I want you to think about it.